From the Toronto Star, I'm Sabah Itazaz, and this matters. Last June, as Canada grappled with the horrifying slaughter of a Muslim family, questions were raised about legislation against Islamophobia and existing laws that might give legitimacy to hate. And now the National Council of Canadian Muslims wants the government to show they're serious about tackling violent and systemic Islamophobia. It's released a list of 60 calls to action to implement policy change at a federal, provincial, and a local level, including challenging Bill 21. Bill 21 is a law in Quebec that bans bearing of religious symbols by public service workers. The provincial government defends it as essential to maintaining secularism. But many say the law has derailed careers and left religious minorities feeling like second-class citizens, especially visibly Muslim women who wear the hijab or the niqab. Meanwhile, just last April, a Quebec Superior Court decided to uphold Bill 21 while also admitting that it violates the rights of Muslim women and has dehumanizing consequences. Many Muslims say it's not just the legislation, but the messaging that provides official legitimacy to Islamophobia and xenophobia. Usually, acts of hate follow. On this matters today, Tanya Suleiman, who is a lawyer and author from Quebec, explains the impact and implications of this particular law from a Canadian Muslim woman's perspective. Hi, Dania. Thanks for being on the podcast with me. Hi, Sabah. Thank you so much for the invitation. So can you take me through the background of Bill 21 a little bit and how it was received at the time? I believe it came out just two years after the attack on the Quebec mosque killing six people. So that must have been particularly painful for Muslims. Yeah, absolutely. Most definitely, since like those attacks at the mosque in January of 2017 were very tragic and brutal. And I think a lot of us from different ethnic backgrounds confused were hoping that this would really be like a strong momentum to let go of identity politics and this whole debate on secularism. But obviously it was not the case. And two years later, Bill 21 was adopted by La CAQ and Le Parti Québécois as well. Even though it was proposed by La CAQ, it was also supported by Le Parti Québécois, the National Assembly. But to give more context, like this predates Bill 21 that was adopted in 2019. We're talking about whether it was 2008, 2009, the crisis around religious accommodation in which Bouchard-Taylor, La Commission Bouchard-Taylor, the Bouchard-Taylor Commission basically toured all of Quebec to kind of get a sense of why there was so much fear around religious accommodation. And then at that time, I guess it was more of like a provincial discussion and no laws were adopted that were like directly a consequence of that. But 2013, 2014 was a huge year in which Le Parti Québécois proposed the Quebec Charter of Values, in which what they were proposing was way more aggressive than what Bill 21 was, is at the moment. And they basically wanted to prohibit the wearing of religious garment, but throughout all of the public function. So any employee within the public sphere wouldn't be allowed. Obviously, that didn't even get uh, tabled or vote on because the budget did not get passed by Le PQ, Le Parti Québécois. And so immediately we went into elections. So Le, Le Parti Québécois was only elected for 18 months. But that, because it was such a huge debate, it really signaled to every other party within the National Assembly that this is a subject that Quebecers wanted a resolution around. And so it wasn't enough that, like, I felt like that year we lucked out because the Parti Québécois, we went straight into election, the last election. So by default, the Quebec Charter of Values was a moot point, but it gave a strong signal to every other political party that if they wanted the approval of a majority of Quebec, they had to discuss about these topics. And so in 2017, the Liberal Party adopted Bill 62, in which it said it was the banning of face coverings, which obviously was a target to Muslim women that were wearing the niqab, even though it's such a moot point because there's about 
I don't know, 30 or like 50, like it's, it's such a small number. So to adopt a, a whole bill for such a small demographic is, is crazy. But then when La CAC got entered and they got elected with a strong majority and they've always been very nationalistic and, you know, pro these types of laws, then it was easy for them to adopt a law both with the approval of a majority of Quebecers, but also them being a majority within the National Assembly. And so it was easy for them to pass the bill differently from a Parti Québécois in 2013 that was a minority government. And so they were playing with fire at the time. So sorry, that's a long answer, but to say that it really predates 2019. Like it starts from 2008, but even more so 2013, in which it really gave a strong signal to the parties that if they wanted an election, they had to talk about this issue. Right. It gives a really good background and framework to this conversation. And I'm surprised to know that Bill 21 is actually a toned down version of yeah. something that was a lot more aggressive. So talking about this bill, even this bill has been consistently challenged in courts by, by Muslims and civil rights groups. And I believe in April this year, a superior court once again upheld this ban. And basically, the court upheld the law, despite acknowledging that it does violate the rights of Muslim women and has dehumanizing consequences for those who wear religious symbols. But they did uphold it with some exemptions. What were your thoughts about that? Very disappointing. I understand that the judge is extremely clear in his judgment that he opposes Bill 21. He says it's not supported factually in terms of the reasons why the government wants to adopt that bill. And I still think, you know, a judge still has leeway to kind of have a dissident opinion than that of the Supreme Court when it comes to the non notwithstanding clause. And he basically said at the end that his hands were tied when it came to the notwithstanding clause in terms of giving basically the province their own small sovereignty, if you want, when it comes to adopting provincial bills in which they invoke the notwithstanding clause. But I feel like he could have You know, while analyzing the Supreme Court judgment in 1988 for it against Quebec and looking at the situation right now with Bill 21 to say that this is the consequences are way bigger and way more grave in this instance, because if we remember 1988, it was a linguistic issue in terms of commercial publicities. And so having commercial ads, both in English and in French. And I feel like right now we're talking about employment, about people having access to work and having access to compensation and even financial freedom and liberty. This is this is huge to prohibit women from accessing their careers. It's completely anti-woman and anti-feminist for a state that says that gender equality is their number one priority. And so I feel like personally, my opinion is I feel like the judge could have parted ways with the Supreme Court judgment in 1988 and say that this matter is way more important and grave than it was then. We're talking about women accessing their careers. And so have another opinion or another judgment, I'm sorry, when it comes to the notwithstanding clause and to say that in this case, it cannot be invoked and we need to respect the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the Quebec Charter as well of Rights and Freedoms. And I do want to come to the the consequences and the repercussions of this that you've just alluded to. The government claims that this law is not singling out any one particular religion or people. But do you agree with the assessment of many that it disproportionately affects particularly visibly Muslim women? And if so, how do you think it has impacted them? I 1000 percent agree with that assessment. It's proven. It's not a an opinion at this point. It's factual. They targeted essentially four areas of professions, prison guards, police officers, judges, and the academic world. And when I say academic, we're really talking about teachers from elementary school all the way to high school. Obviously, professors within university, they have more leeway, but we're talking about educators with children or young teenagers. So it goes from like the the principal to the vice principal to the actual teacher in a classroom. And absolutely, if we look at the domains and professions in which a lot of Muslim women with a hijab tend to congregate towards, it is the world of l'enseignement, like the teaching world. And so I remember when I was talking about Bill 21 with an American friend not long ago, and he said it reminded 
him of the war on drugs in the 1970s in which, you know, for him, you know, maybe within the language of the war on drugs, it seemed like it was maybe targeting everyone. But truly, when we looked at the demographic being targeted, it was African-Americans and it was the group that they wanted to incarcerate. So I feel like it's very disingenuous for any Quebecers to say that this is like an impartial law that targets anyone that wears a religious symbol when you've specifically targeted a profession in which you know that a lot of Muslim women that wear the hijab tends to choose that as a profession. And so it's like, Who's wearing a religious symbol within judges? No one. It's all white francophone judges. We're lucky if we get even a person of color as a judge. So there's like a few, a handful, literally maybe like a handful of black judges. So having a religious symbol is just not even a conversation yet within judges. Same for prison guards, same for police officers. But when it comes to teachers, that is a concern and it tends to be women on top of it. So that's why I think that those judgments in this law, Bill 21, is anti-woman because it directly targets a demographic, Muslim women wearing the hijab in this case. We'll be right back. This also kind of alludes to the framework that's being created of discrimination, particularly against Muslim women. I wanted to know if this has impacted you personally or what do you think is the hardest thing about being a Muslim in Quebec and overall in Canada? Yeah. And if that Mm -hmm. looks particularly different for visibly Muslim women, uh, women wearing hijab, for instance, as well. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of that specific bill, because it's not I'm not a teacher, I'm not a prison guard nor a judge. But I could be one day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as a lawyer, I could always <laughs> ascend to being a judge. And if I w- were to be wearing a religious symbol, I'd know in advance that I couldn't. But r- in my life, practically, no, it doesn't have an effect. But it has an effect emotionally and even socially, because you know that you're part of a demographic that's being targeted by your own government. And so, you know, neither me nor anyone in my family. My mom does wear the hijab herself. She doesn't happen to work as a teacher, but, you know, I think of her that if she were to be wearing the hijab and if she wanted to ascend to being a teacher, then that wouldn't be possible for her. So I do have friends that have been personally targeted by this law. And I think it just, I think the overall feeling is just feeling that we're not fully Canadian and we do not have access to the same rights as our other Quebec peers, you know, that happen to be white or non-religious or not people of faith, which is completely fine. But it's like, if we've tried building the society on principles of equality, then telling us that we're not as equal wearing a religious symbol, especially one as a visible minority, then you're telling us we're not equal citizens. And so I think that that, that's like the larger sentiment felt here in Quebec and that we're not really being cared for. And I, I think to come back to your initial question about this is only two years after it was adopted, two years after the Quebec shooting the Quebec shooting was huge. And even then we feel like it's an afterthought, you know, and when it comes to, let's say, La Polytechnique in the 90s or in 1990, when a man entered La Polytechnique, which is like an engineering school and gunned down women, and it was considered the feminicide. And every year Quebec does a memory, like an exercise of memory to remember those women that were killed. And then a lot of Muslim people feel like Quebec is not doing that same exercise of commemoration and memory when it comes to the Quebec shooting in 2017 when six men were gunned down based on hate and Islamophobia. And so, yeah, there is a feeling that we're not as integral to the Quebec society or as important to the Quebec society. And I think that's what hurts a lot of people. Tanya, you've also written an excellent book on the reconciliations between feminism and religion. And I really do want to read that. But unfortunately, I don't know French, but I'm going to have to wait for an English translation, hopefully soon. But I do want to know your thoughts on how you think Bill 21 and the discourse around it kind of ties into how women's bodies are perceived, policed or politicized from a feminist perspective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Bill 21 basically says, do not come as you are. 
who you are is a threat to impartial education. You wearing your religious symbol, and let me me be clear here, the religious symbol that's targeted is the hijab. It's Muslim woman wearing the veil. But it basically says, do not come as you are and who you are is a threat to offering impartial education to our young kids that having your garment needs to be uh, neutral in appearance, but there's no such thing as neutrality. There's only a thing called normality. And so if the norm is most people are not wearing a religious symbol and you're different or you're part of a minority because you are wearing one, they're essentially saying that we don't want to see a diversity. We want to see a homogeneity within the teaching world. And so we don't want to see Muslim women wearing the veil within those spaces. And I think it's in that way that it's policed. And in another way, it's also literally telling women that it's no surprise that having access to employment has literally been one of the greatest ways for women to get emancipation and liberation. That's when women were able to start divorcing. That's when women were able to make autonomous choices for themselves. And so you're literally asking women to like go back a hundred or 120 years, you know, ago and tell them that, They can't work as they are. They can't touch their money, be dependent on someone else or go get a job in which you're invisible, that you wouldn't be in our public spaces the way you are right now. And so I think it's completely anti-feminist. As I said earlier, it's completely anti-woman. And I think post-colonial feminism and not so much white feminism is a framework that I've used within my book in which I think it really gives back to each woman their own terms to their emancipation. And so if a woman asserts that she's happy and free wearing the hijab, do not approach her with your paternalistic point of view, thinking that you know what liberation is and emancipation is, and there's no such thing to being free within something that you consider patriarchal here being a religion. And so you're telling her that's impossible. It's impossible for you to be free within a religion. And so you're not really emancipated and you're not really a feminist. But a lot of women are doing work in which they're reviewing religious scripture and they're analyzing it from a woman perspective and from a feminist perspective. And so post-colonial feminism puts the woman at the center of her own emancipation and does not try to talk with a singular discourse of, you know, every woman needs to adopt this posture to be liberated or to be free or to access freedom or to be equal with their other peers or men. It kind of gives women their own terms to their personal emancipation. So this argument is made time and again by policymakers, by the Quebec government, that this is actually an attempt at at better integration of everyone within a secular society. And it was necessary to sort of preserve the secular spirit of the province. Uh, What do you make of that argument? I think it's a false argument because integration, when you look at sociological studies, it goes through accessing employment. It's being present within public spheres, being interested in political discourse and voting. It's also trying to learn the language of the country. It's also attending the universities and the educational facilities within the country or the province. And so in many ways, most cultural and ethnic and religious minorities in Canada and in Quebec are integrated because they are going to public schools, they are attending universities, they are trying to find work within their provinces, within Canada. And so I think it's it's a false argument because it's shown that finding work within your new host society is one of the best ways to integrate within your new society. And so stripping away work from certain women is literally asking them not to integrate. So I think Bill 21 is anti-integration because if you were pro-integration, you would want to find any tool that you, you may have to create alternative spaces for the most people possible to be present within a profession. And so limiting a profession based on wearing a religious garment is literally preventing them from integrating even better within their society. So I think it's anti-integration. 
So, Dania, what do you think about a lot of people's assessment that whenever we see this kind of political signaling and legislation, it leads to Islamophobia and more anti-Muslim hate crimes because it kind of lends to those damaging stereotypes about Muslims? And also, how much of that conversation around Bill 21 has been reignited again in the wake of the devastating attack on the Afzal family in London, Ontario? Yeah, absolutely. I do think that when such bills like Bill 21 is being adopted and the government is so proud to say it's being backed by 70% of Quebecers, it got backed by a majority of elected officials at the National Assembly, it really sends a strong message within Quebec society that those are second-class citizens and you may treat them as you want. And so there's no surprise that when you adopt such a bill, then there is a rise in hate crimes. There is a rise in vandalism. There is a, a rise in, you know, hate speech and Islamophobia in this case, because literally your government is giving you a green light, a thumbs up in saying they're not as important. And so you may treat them as you want. This is our country. This is our province. And we're not going to let ourselves be intimidated by ethnic, cultural or religious minorities. So absolutely, there's always a correlation between adopting a bill that's visibly discriminatory and then the rise of hate speech or intimidation or harassment or Islamophobia. And then obviously what happened to the Azal family in London, Ontario is absolutely tragic. I think here in Quebec, it echoed extremely hard with the Quebec mass shooting in 2017 that was like very devastating for us, for me as well on a personal level. And I think the timing also was very close in that the latest judgment from the Superior Court of Quebec came April 20th, 2021. And so the conversation around Bill 21, it being, again, part of the public sphere, I don't think is a direct correlation with what happened in London, Ontario, rather than a new judgment came out and it will definitely be a appealed both by the Quebec government and also by the opposing party to try to see another judgment on it from the Court of Appeal of Quebec. And I would say it's not necessarily linked to what happened. And I think what echoed more severely and more personally, you know, was really the Quebec mass shooting in 2017, that, you know, this this is what I think hits harder in our imagination rather than directly Bill 21 right now. Thank you so much for your time, Dania. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. My pleasure. I was talking to author and lawyer Dania Suleiman. While based in New York right now, Dania is originally from Montreal, and she's written the book La Mala Tandu, which aims to explore the intersections of feminism and religion. That's it for today. Thanks so much for listening. This Matters is hosted and produced by me, Sabai Tazaz, Adrian Chung, and Raju Mutter. Produced and mixed by Sean Pattenden. And our director of programming is J.P. Fozo. Our show theme music is by So Called. And our episode music is by Mike DeAngelis. We want to hear what stories matter to you. Please send us comments, questions, or ideas to thismatters at thestar.ca. Please consider supporting the journalism the Toronto Star Newsroom does at thestar.com. And don't forget to subscribe to This Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Let's talk soon. 